Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Good morning, my name is Jonna McDougall, and I'd like to welcome you here to Liberty Church Main Line. I'm delighted to see you, especially on this gloomy, rainy Sunday, where it's definitely more tempting to stay home and watch football. Oh wait, no, that's California time. <laughs> Have brunch and then stay in and watch football. Please join me in this call to worship found on page one of your worship folder. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who have lived in land of deep darkness on them the light has shined. Please stand for our prayer. <clears throat> our dear Heavenly Father, you are the creator of light and all that is good. Thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Help us to be givers and not just recipients of your light, so that we may bring others out of the shadows and into the light of your redeeming love. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Please remain standing.
please be seated. Hear this call to confession found on page three of your worship folder. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And it's um, probably no coincidence, but telling that our theme today is light, because this is something that I start really paying attention to this time of year, because I hate to see the days getting shorter, you know? Now it seems to be at 7 o'clock and we're in the house turning the lights on. And that's what we do. When it's dark, our first instinct is to dispel it, to turn on a light. Not that that's a bad thing, that's a good thing. But sometimes in wanting the light, it's because we don't want to look at maybe the darkness that's in ourselves. We want to ignore it. We want to dispel it. And yet, Jesus calls us to confess. He calls us to take the time to sit in the darkness and see the parts of us that dwell there stubbornly at times. And so confession is a time where we can examine ourselves and bring these things from the dark into the light of God's forgiving love. Please join me in the prayer of confession. God of grace, you have given us, Jesus, the light of the world but we choose darkness and cling to things that hide the brightness of your love. Immersed in ourselves, we have not risen to new life. Baptize us with your spirit that, forgiven and renewed, we may preach your word to the nations and tell of your glory shining in the face of Jesus Christ, our Lord and light forever. Amen. Let's take a few moments to silently confess our sins. stand to receive these words of pardon. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please remain standing. Vindicate me, O oh God, and defend my cause against the deceitful man.
Please be seated. Well, it says here we're going to have a spotlight announcement from the women's ministry, but I think that's next week that we're doing it, unless there's someone here who wants to talk about it. Next week. Okay. Well, then before we pass the piece, I'll just um, talk a couple of a quick announcements. We invite you to stay after the service for another Connect lunch. Um, Grab a box, sit at a table, and just chat with everyone else. We're kind of coming into the remaining few weeks of our September kickoff. And then next Sunday, we will be having an all-church meeting. And so there will be lunch and child care available. And so I encourage you to make plans to stay for that. We'll um, bring Mike O'Brien back into the fold of being an elder. And, <laughs> and we will give you an, uh, an update on... Um, things that are happening now and what we anticipate for the future. And then one final announcement, we are doing a coat drive for Grand Stepping Up Winter Gear. There's a box out there in the foyer. So I encourage you to bring things um, for next Sunday. I believe that's the last week we'll be collecting. Okay, I now invite you to pass the peace. And children, you may go.
Good morning, Liberty Church Mainline. It's good to see you as we gather for worship this morning. Uh, if I haven't had a chance to meet you, my name is Matt. I'm the lead pastor here at Liberty. I want to extend a welcome to you. Uh, again, a reminder, if you didn't catch it earlier, we will be having a meal. It's a lighter box lunch meal, partly because we had the men's retreat this uh, past weekend. So if there's any families who are trying to just like survive the weekend while dad's away, uh, feel free to grab uh, meals and blast off. Uh, if you're able to stay, it would be awesome to share a meal together with you. Uh, with that, I invite you to turn to our scripture reading for this morning. Uh, we are continuing in the Sermon on the Mount, um, and I'm actually going to modify the reading a little bit and focus uh, on the verses, uh, chapter 5, verses 11 through 16, uh, so the first three paragraphs, if you have it in your worship folder this morning. Let's hear the living word of the living God for us. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. People do not light a lamp and put it under the bushel basket. Rather, they put it on the lampstand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray for understanding this passage. Our Lord and God, we ask that today you would encourage us deeply with the words of Jesus. We are in a world where there's lots of darkness. Uh, there's lots that is um, hard and difficult. We uh, see and receive words spoken against us, and it can be heartbreaking uh, and discouraging. So we pray that as we come to hear your words today, that you give us a new vision of the reality of who you are and the reality of who we are by your grace so that we might know that whatever we hear from the voices outside of us and the voices inside of us, you are the God who brings us into your presence by your good gift. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This fall, we're studying the Sermon on the Mount, and it's one of the most influential texts in human history. And even in an increasingly post-Christian America, the language and imagery we've commented are uh, Im imagery and language that continues to shape our personal and our collective cultural imagination. Uh, we could even say it does that sometimes in exceptional ways in light of the passage this morning. Carlos Lozado's July 7th column in the New York Times posed the question, is America a city on a hill or a nation on a precipice? And he traced the long-lasting influence of the 1630 sermon by John Winthrop, a model of Christian charity, where he referred to this passage and applied it to the life of a community established in what's now Massachusetts. Winthrop was not a pastor, actually, but a lawyer and the governor of Massachusetts Bay Colony. And he was addressing his fellow citizens as they embarked on the Puritan project of creating a new political, uh, economic, and religious community in New England. But this imagery has continued to echo through the years in our nation. So President Reagan more recently repeatedly referenced Winthrop's sermon throughout his political career and actually concluded in his 1989 Oval Office farewell that the United States was once again a shining city upon a hill. And for those of you who follow political discourse, this is closely linked with the idea of American exceptional exceptionalism, the uh, often contested uh, idea that the United States is or should be a unique nation in the world today or in human history. Now, all of that is to orient us to the way this imagery has shaped us in our uh, contemporary day, and yet, it's all prelude to say, for us to understand what Jesus was talking about, 
we actually have to unlearn that recent history and go back to what Jesus is saying because he had a very different vision for what he's talking about. Jesus is talking about all Christians from every nation throughout history who know and follow him and the calling that he gives to us as we do so. As Jesus says here, uh, and as we'll see this morning, following him involves a privilege, a price, and a promise. So this morning we'll look at the privilege, the price, and the promise. First, following Jesus involves a great privilege. He says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And we have to slow down and ask some questions about these statements. Who is Jesus talking to? He starts this uh, sermon that we know as the Sermon on the Mount now by going up a mountainside. And it might be so that he could be heard better by a larger audience because there are great crowds following him at this point in his ministry. But as he does that, he also actually has his disciples come close to him. They are, they are two audiences. And the primary audience are those who have identified with him and are following him and seeking to shape their life around him and his teachings. And if there's any nation in human history, this is quite interesting because if there's any nation in human history with a legitimate claim to national exceptionalism, it would have been ancient Israel, the nation chosen from among the nations by the Lord God himself. And yet, Jesus, surrounded by this crowd of fellow countrymen, fellow Israelites, fellow Jews, Jesus says, let me tell you about the kingdom of God And he turns to his disciples and says, you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. You are different, you are distinctive, and you are vital. What's salt for? In the ancient world, uh, salt not only provided flavor, but most agree that the strongest uh, connotation here would be that salt was the single most important preservative. There's no refrigeration, right? Salt prevented food from spoiling. And so Jesus is saying, here's your job. Here's the privilege of what you are called to do as a follower of me. There's essentially a rot in every human society because there is a certain rot spoiling in every individual human heart. And Jesus says, I am calling you to stop the rot, to preserve what is good in the world around you. And you are the light of the world. What does light do? It allows you to see. Everything else in the world depends on our ability to see. Imagine if you put blackout curtains in your house and you then try to do a home improvement project. How is that going to go? It probably is not going to, it's probably not going to go well, and uh, you're probably going to get injured, and when you actually open up the blackout curtains, it's not going to look anything like what you were hoping it would look like. Uh, Closer to home, uh, Rebecca gives me a hard time because I'm so bad at navigating uh, in the dark. So we turn out the lights. Sometimes, you know, she's going to bed a couple minutes before me, or I need to get up and, like, use the bathroom. And if I don't turn the light on, I'm going to stub my toe on the foot of the bed. I am going to run into a chair or a dresser, and I will probably collide with the door frame of the bathroom door, all which, of course, will make so much noise that I wake up anyone I was trying not to wake up by not turning the lights on. So uh, light is vital because it enlightens everything else. But it's not always comfortable. You know, a very simple level. If you're in a dark space or sort of an artificial light space, and then you go out into a bright summer afternoon, what happens? It kind of hurts. You're like squinting as you adjust to the light. If you're like me, you'll probably sneeze. uh, And... It's uncomfortable to go from darker low light into light. 
Uh, I remember in high school English reading Henry David Thoreau, and he talked about how he felt like people should be more transparent in their lives. And he didn't like that when he got invited over to somebody's house, there were certain rooms where it's like, oh, you can be in the living room, you can be in the dining room, but you know, don't go into these other parts of the house. And he felt like, oh, we should be more transparent, more generally hospitable. I don't know how often he got invited over as a result of these assumptions of other people. But uh, as I th- remember that imagery, I think, You know, there are, we invite people over, and yeah, there's some rooms that's like, we're just going to keep that door closed. Uh, That's the room that we dumped all the junk that was on the dining table 15 minutes before you arrived, so we're just going to, we're just going to keep that door closed. Uh, And often we have rooms in our lives where we just don't want to open the door, and we don't want the light to go on. We just want to kind of keep it closed, because it's painful for certain things to be exposed. Light is vital because it enlightens everything else. And it's incredibly powerful. There's a a fantastic quote in the most recent Rings of Power episode where a character says, it's not strength that overcomes darkness, but light. Armies may rise, hearts may fail, yet still light endures and is mightier than strength for in its presence, all darkness must flee. But here's the privilege of being salt of the earth and light of the world. And Jesus isn't talking to the governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony or the president of the United States or the leader of any other nation in the world or in history. Because the most important characteristic he highlights is not national identity or citizenship, whether you're Israelite, American, or anything else, or ethnic identity, whether you're Jewish or Greek, or European, or African, or Asian, or anything else, the single most important question is, what is your relationship with Jesus himself? That's what leads into this section. Jesus says, you are blessed if you're persecuted because of, verse 10, righteousness. If you're spoken evil of, verse 12, because on my account, or because of me, because of Jesus. Jesus is saying the most important thing is your affiliation with me. What's that relationship like? And he assumes that it will be costly. He assumes it will be costly, that there will be a price that will involve persecution, hostility, that it will involve people reviling you, speaking evil about you. Now, the funny thing is that a strange assumption of modern people, I actually uh, had this pointed out uh, by the, um, uh, the journalist Malcolm Gladwell uh, when he was profiling recent um, efforts at um, campus ac- uh, activism. And he pointed out that we have this strange modern assumption that we think meaningful change can happen in our worlds without a cost. Evil is really evil, then resisting evil is going to be costly. If the human heart is selfish, then exposing it is going to be costly. And the rot is deeper than we want to admit. Uh, Men's Retreat was on Long Beach Island, and on the way there, there was this big billboard. I assume it was by a community organization, a local nonprofit, and said, hate has no place on Long Beach Island. I said, are there no people there? (laughs) Because I, I understand the sentiment. I understand the sentiment. And yet the reality is the problem is not that it's just an easy checkbox. The problem is that my heart stirs up and flares for a variety of reasons. And then certain people can provoke that. And then the issue is that hate flows naturally out of my heart unless Jesus extinguishes it. The human heart, resisting the evil of the human heart is incredibly costly and painful. If the biblical story is true, then all of our chaos flows out of this great rupture between us and our creator, and we shouldn't be surprised that setting the world right means a battle. There's a battle within each and every one of us. And there's also a battle 
with evil in the world in the people, even the people we love and enjoy and appreciate. The same battle we have in ourselves is in the hearts of every one of our beloved family members and friends and neighbors and coworkers and citizens. And it's going to be costly. There's a price. But I will say, pastors throughout the ages have said, don't misunderstand. Let's slow down because it's easy to assume, well, people just don't like me and I'm being persecuted. The, uh, there's a very succinctly was said by C.H. Spurgeon, the 19th century London pastor. And he said, lest you think that the mere fact of being evil spoken of makes men blessed, Christ has set two limitations. Without, uh, he says, um, when it's for his sake and when the things are said are false. Without these, he who is spoken evil of so far from being blessed is miserable. If, evil, if people speak evil about you, but it's true, I'm sorry, that's not persecution. That is a call to repentance. And I encourage you to do that. Uh, if people speak evil about you because you're obnoxious, you're not suffering from Jesus, you're suffering because you're insufferable. But God has grace for you, and that's the good news. But there is this incredible encouragement because for 10 years, I was a pastor in a small town in Western Pennsylvania. And in a small town in Western Pennsylvania or many small towns across the country, everybody knows everybody's business. It's kind of uncomfortable. And everybody has an opinion about everybody else's business. And that's even more fun. And, <laughs> and so you, you would often hear, and because I was kind of networked through the community, you'd hear everybody's opinion about everybody else's business. And I often heard people and knew, because of different conversations, I knew somebody had made a hard decision or somebody was doing something difficult and other people didn't have all the information, and so they were judging it, criticizing it, speaking evil about them in public because they didn't have the whole story. And it wasn't appropriate for them to have this whole story. And it wasn't appropriate for the person that they were criticizing to tell everybody the whole story. And so the encouragement here that I would give to you is every one of us will probably at some point have somebody say something about us that's hurtful and false and incorrect and you're really you're doing what you're supposed to do you're doing something that's hard and God says I see that and even when other people are saying that about you I know what is true and I you can't change what people say about you but you can rest in the truth that God knows what's going on a common critique today is that it's all too easy to virtue signal, to use something like social media to proclaim to the world how important we think a cause is, how good or horrible we think some person or group or event is. And since we live in Pennsylvania in election year, we are getting lots of texts and mailers and everything about the horrible people that are running for office. But there's a difference between virtue signaling Posting online, liking something, whatever, buying something that says on a t-shirt what we think. There's a difference between that, which costs almost nothing, and true virtue, which is incredibly costly. Loving someone, meeting a need, sharing a burden. About virtue signaling, Jesus is actually going to say later in the sermon, don't do things ostentatiously for the praise of others. But about virtue, Jesus says here, do good so that God gets the praise. So that God gets the praise. Some of you are familiar with the quote from longtime pastor John Piper. He liked to say, missions exist because worship doesn't. And one of the ways that we invite people into the worship of God is by doing good to one another and to those around us in simple and specific and concrete ways. Whether or not someone's going to appreciate it, whether or not someone's going to be grateful, whether or not someone's going to acknowledge it. Because we don't do good to get credit 
for ourselves, we do good to give credit to God, who has given us everything we have. And that brings us to the promise. There's something that we miss easily as English readers. Jesus says, you are salt of the earth. You are light of the world. But he's not saying you, 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 you. He's saying you. Or as our southern friends and family members will say, y'all are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. We are these things together as we follow Jesus. You are a city on a hill. There's something that's really basic about cities, right? So I lived in, ironically, a place called Grove City, population 8,000. I'm not sure it qualified. Uh, My brother-in-law and sister-in-law lived in a city. He was a pastor in a city called Prairie City. The prairie was more accurate than the city, population 1,800. Uh, And if you're driving down a a highway and you see a billboard on the roadside, which means you're probably in a movie or a cartoon, because I don't think we actually have these in real life anymore, but you're entering into a city and says, population one. You're not driving into a city. You're probably driving by somebody's house, right? You cannot be a city on a hill by yourself, and neither can I. It's when we gather as followers for worship and community and for mercy in the neighborhoods where Jesus places us, and that's when we are a city on a hill. And there's a promise in that. Just before COVID, we uh, were able as a family to do a trip that I had long waited for, to visit Scotland. Some of my ancestors are from Scotland originally. And one of the places we visited was Stirling. The skyline of Stirling is dominated by Stirling Castle. The ancient cities were put on hills so that they were defensive fortifications, safe places. But there's an interesting feature about Stirling Castle, which was incredibly striking. I didn't actually know it before we were going, and so it pops Most of the castle is your standard dark gray stone, but there's a great hall that was built by one of the kings of Scotland, and it is gleaming golden. It is visible from anywhere in the surrounding region. It is striking. It's, of course, almost always foggy uh, because it's Scotland, and yet you can see it. It pops in the landscape if you have a line of sight. And the reason is because it was coated with a layer of lime wash, and that was partly to protect the stonework, but the color was chosen to signal that Stirling Castle was the home of the king. We have the privilege that we enjoy, and we enjoy that not because of anything in us, but because of Jesus because he makes his dwelling place among us. You are a city on a hill if you follow him, because he dwells among us. And Jesus says, as we conclude, that, or actually it's John's gospel says that Jesus, through Jesus all things are made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all people. And yet, light came into the darkness, and people did not receive it. In fact, Jesus tells this parable about uh, the sower who is profligate throwing seed on the ground. And some of it falls on soil. Some of it falls on pathways. It's getting trampled down. It's in rocks where there's no hope of growth. The The seed is the word of God. But the Bible tells us that Jesus is God's word in person. And he came to have his name and his reputation trampled in the ground. To have his light snuffed out at the darkness of the cross. Who hung there for false charges that he was accused of when all Jesus had ever done was good to those around him. And he did that because he knew this is the way I can bring light into your life. And this is what I am doing so that when that happens, you might know I did not come to condemn you. I did not come to turn lights on and to make you feel worse about yourself, but so that you could come out of darkness into light. At the men's retreat, uh, it was observed that the first question in the Bible is, where are you? 
Is that because God needed more information? No. It's an invitation. Come out of the darkness and into the light. And when following him is hard, when people speak ill of you, you can rejoice because you're following in the footsteps of not just prophets, but of Jesus himself. Because the king has gone before you, leading the way, and you will not lose your reward because your reward is Jesus himself. This is the good news in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Lord and God, we thank and praise you for these words of Jesus that he comes as light, he comes as love, he comes pursuing us. Father, for some of us, this is hard. And we ask that you would give the gift of your Holy Spirit to hear these things and to see where you would change us and ultimately how you would draw us to yourself. Father, we thank you for the gift of your son that we do not have principles that we follow, but a person who dwells with us. And we look forward to the fullness of that gift in the new heavens and the new earth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Friends, we're going to join in the Apostles' Creed, which is printed for you in the worship folder. This is one of our habits of worship each week as we gather to share in one of the historic creeds of Christian faith that reminds us what it is that binds us together and makes us this special kind of a family. So let me ask you if you'll stand together and we'll join in this Apostles' Creed. Liberty Church, let us say what we believe. We believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You can be seated. And we'll come together to the Lord's table. This is where Jesus invites all of you to follow him, to know him, and to take his body and blood into your own and become part of him as well. We'll join in the Great Thanksgiving, which if you've not done this with us before, it's a song. It's really interesting how we do this. The band will lead us in the plain fonts, and together we'll sing the bold fonts. Right it is, and our joyful duty to give thanks to you at all times and in all places. O Lord, our Creator, almighty and everlasting God, you created heaven with all its hosts and the earth with all its plenty. You have given us life and being, and you preserve us by your providence. But you have shown us the fullness of your love in sending into the world your Son, Jesus Christ, the eternal Word made flesh for us and for our salvation. For the precious gift of this mighty Savior who has reconciled us to you, we praise and bless you, O God. With your whole church on earth and with all the company of heaven, we worship and adore your glorious name. Say it. Most 
righteous God, we remember in this supper the perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the whole world. In the joy of his resurrection and in expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. Together we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Spirit upon us, we pray that the bread which we break and the cup which we bless may be to us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Grant that being together in him, we may attain to the unity of the faith and grow up in all things in Christ our Lord. And as this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf and these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Praise to the Father, praise to the Son, praise to the Spirit, our God the Father. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And he said, take and eat this, all of you. This is my body, broken for you. And in a similar way, after supper, he took a cup of wine and said, take and drink this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood so that sins may be forgiven. Whenever you do this, remember me. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast let me offer just a brief word of instruction for this moment together. If you've not joined us for a communion before, uh, everyone who follows Jesus is invited to take this meal with us. This is the Lord's table, and he invites you to it. You can come down the center aisle when you are ready and break off a piece of bread, dip it off into the cup of your choice. The large one is wine, the shorter one is juice, and then you can go out the side aisles. If you are not a Christian that follows Jesus, if that's not part of your faith and convictions today, you're welcome into this moment as well. And instead of feeling compelled to participate in a sacrament that's not really yours, we invite you to think about the one who's inviting you into this moment, which is Jesus himself. There are prayers that are printed in the worship folder that could be helpful for you. We invite you to think through those. If you even want to come forward, you can, and we'd be glad to pray for you. But you shouldn't feel compelled uh, or feel like you need to step forward at this moment. With that, let me ask if John could come help me to serve. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. and pray finding me thine all in all Jesus paid it all all to him I know sin that left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow
sing together. Friends, we're going to join in a short set of prayers here together. What I'll do is lead us in three short prayers, and after each one, I'll say, Lord, in your mercy, together we can say, hear our prayer. And one of the special prayers we'll be offering today is for Liberty Bristol, which is having their first services this morning. And there are some of us who will remember when Liberty Center, uh, Liberty Mainline had our first services together. It's a big morning. It's a big deal for those who've been preparing for a long time for that. So let us go to the Lord in prayer together today. Lord, you are the God of justice and the Prince of Peace, and we feel terribly far from peace and justice in our world today. We need all of you to break into our reality, bring a peaceful end to conflict, and healing to families and communities destroyed by war. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Father, we lift up Liberty Bristol as they launch their first worship service as a new church. We pray for their pastor, Kyle Connect, and his wife, Laura, as they step out in faith to lead and grow your church. May they live, speak, and serve as the body of Christ in Bristol. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Father, thank you for meeting us in the men's retreat this weekend and the many people that supported and made that possible. In that theme of friendship, we pray for the courage and commitment to both seek out and embrace friendship in our lives and to reorder our days and weeks and months to prioritize deep, meaningful, and lasting friendship together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray now as our Lord Jesus has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Um, we're going to come down just a, a short period of offering and our final song together. Uh, for those of you that do not do so yet, we invite you to be a financial partner with Liberty Church. Today we're doing uh, our QR code and our link online. Um, there's some discussion that maybe we'll be passing uh, plates and uh, welcoming cash gifts as well in the future. But for now, digital gifting is great. It is part of how we worship and return a portion of our gifts back to the Lord for the work of his church here. 
with that, please stand again and join in our final song. Oh, love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe. That in thine ocean's depths its flow may richer, fuller be. reminder, we will have lunch for you, your family, your neighbors. Go grab some people, bring them on in if you want to, but please join us and stay for lunch. And hear now these words of benediction as we go together. May your life be a sign of Christ's life so that others may come to believe that the Lord is risen indeed. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. <laughs>